catch up with us on what yeah. you get. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the September 2nd, 2021 uh, meeting of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. <clears throat> the first item uh, on our agenda is the approval of the draft minutes for our July 15 meeting. Uh, I move their approval. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, all those opposed? Abstentions? Uh, the motion carries. Uh, the next item uh, on our agenda are the uh, chairs of yeah. the remarks. Um, so uh, here goes. Uh, today we will announce uh, public matching fund payments uh, to candidates participating in New York City's general election in November. Today's payments are based on campaign finance disclosure filings that the candidates submitted to the CFB last week uh, by uh, April, uh, by August uh, 27. Uh, the city's enhanced eight to one match for small contributions from New York City residents helped fuel the most competitive primary election season and the highest voter turnout that we've seen in decades. Today's payments ensure candidates are able to compete through the general election without relying on large contributions alone. Thus far, the CFP has paid over $114 million to candidates running for office in New York City's 2021 election cycle, matching small donations from New Yorkers. After payments are announced, we will hear from two candidates regarding enforcement matters from the 2017 election cycle. We will vote on violations and penalties relating uh, to uh, those campaigns. We will vote uh, to ratify public matching funds payments previously issued uh, on uh, August 12th. And we will vote to ratify my approval of a Section 709 uh, rule petition uh, considering uh, considered during the previous meeting. Uh, now I will turn it over to Executive Director Amy Lopez for her announcements. Thank you very much. Um, I just have brief announcements. Last month at our Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, we heard, had our annual We the Young People hearing and where we heard um, from, from youth activists across the city about their work in encouraging uh, young people to get out and vote and what their concerns are about the voting system we have today. Um, last night on the same theme, we heard uh, the final presentations of our youth ambassadors who had done research on a variety of topics that are of interest to youth and how voting uh, impacts those individual topics. So all that material will be available on our, on our website. And I encourage you to uh, look at some of these really inspiring work of these inspiring young people who are really going to be the future and are really driving civic engagement for their generation. So uh, with that, I can move on to the public funds announcement if you are ready, Chair Schaefer. Uh, yes, please. Uh, why don't you lay that out for us so we can vote on it? Okay. Uh, today, the CFB staff recommends issuing public funds payments totaling $6,280,701 to 48 candidates in the 2021 elections, gen in the general election. For mayor, CFB staff recommends payments to two candidates totaling $4,555,157. Eric Adams, $1,952,004. Two million six hundred and three and one hundred and fifty three dollars for a controller, Brad Lander, seventy one thousand five hundred eighty two dollars for borough presidents. The CFB is recommending payments to six candidates totaling two hundred and seventeen thousand seven hundred forty nine dollars and to in Brooklyn rent Antonio Reynoso three thousand one hundred and sixteen in Queens Donovan Richards one thousand four hundred and six. In Staten Island, Mark Murphy, 146,165. Letitia Romero, 24,502. In the Bronx, Vanessa Gibson, 29,374. Sam Revelo, 13,186. 
for city council, the CFD recommends payments to 39 candidates totaling $1,436,213. In District 1, Maud Marin, $134,512. Christopher Marte, 17,005. In District 5, Mark Foley, 18,430. Julie Menon, 53,825. In District 10, Edwin De La Cruz, 39,322. In District 11, Eric Dinowitz, 1,520. In District 13, Alexander Michi, 90,136. In District 15, Oswald Felix, 3,990. In District 19, Tony Avella, 40,546. Vicki Palladino, 28,918. In District 20, Yu Ching Pai, 115,623. In District 22, Edwin De Jesus, 2,432. Felicia Kalan, 9,279. In District 23, Linda Lee, 53,907. James Riley, 59,185. In District 24, James Gennaro, 59,071. Mujib Rahman, 20,558. In District 25, Fatima Bar Bariab, 160,444. Shikhar Krishnan, 790. In District 26, Marvin Jeffcoat, 11,514. Julia, Julie, one, 17,282. In District 29, Michael Conario, 6,270. Lynn Shulman, 52,318. In District 31, Sylvina Brooks Powers, 77,769. Vanessa Simon, 6,133. In District 32, Joanne Ariola, 62,116. Felicia Singh, 95,578. Kenichi Wilson, 380. In District 35, Regina Kinsey, 13,034. In District 43, Brian Fox, 13,946. In District 46, Donald Cranston, 23,020. In District 47, Ari Kagan, 35,479. In District 48, Stephen Saperstein, 94,055. Ina Vernikov, 9,622. In District 49, Camilla Hanks, 3,378. Patricia Rondinali, 1,862. In District 50, David Carr, 1,900. George Wanika, 760. And in District 51, Olivia Drabsnick, 304. Thank you. Uh, I move that we approve uh, those uh, payments. Uh, is there a second? Uh, second, but it, this is, I have to, this is Richard Davis. I noticed that there's a payment being made to Maud Marin. I believe she has a lawsuit pending against the Legal Aid Society. I'm chairman of the board of the Legal Aid Society. So as to that one payment, I need to be recused. Very well, thank you. Uh, is uh, the motion has been made and seconded? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Uh, next on our agenda, we have appearances by two candidates. Uh, Amy, uh, somebody was going to appear in person. Is, has that person arrived? She does not appear to, to be here as of yet. Okay, so oh. then we'll go, we're going to... That is correct. I was just <laughs> interpreting a way of whether it was yes or no. She is not here okay. yet. So we're going to take the candidates in the order that was originally uh, on our agenda. Uh, the first candidate appearance uh, is uh, uh, Dacia Imperiali. Uh, is uh, Ms. Imperiali and or her representative here? 
I believe so. I saw her name, um, Naomi Pena. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you, are, you, you, you represent uh, Miss Imperiale? Yes. Good. So uh, the, the way we proceed is I'm going to uh, ask uh, uh, the CFB uh, attorney uh, to sort of roughly or briefly summarize uh, what the issues are. Uh, this will just take a minute or so. Uh, then I'm going to give you an opportunity to say whatever you have to say. Uh, there may be some response. There may be some questions from members of the board. Uh, when we're all done uh, with this and the next candidate appearance, uh, we'll deliberate and then come back and, and announce our decision. Uh, okay? Sounds great. Okay, uh, Joe, why don't you start? Thank you. Good morning, Chair Schaefer, members of the board, Executive Director Loprest and Ms. Pena. I'm Joseph Gallagher, Senior Associate Counsel for the CFB, and appearing with me today is Victoria Telt, a Senior Auditor at the CFB. Before the board this morning is the matter of the Dacia Imperial campaign in the 2017 primary election for City Council District 1 in Manhattan. The campaign was a participant in the program and received public funds. CFB staff recommends that the board find the campaign committed the following four violations of the act and board rules. Failing to report transactions, filing a late disclosure statement, failing to demonstrate that spending was in furtherance of the campaign, and failing to respond to the draft audit report. The campaign contests these recommended violations and penalties. Okay. Uh, let's hear from the campaign. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, it's, I appreciate you taking time out to put me on the calendar to address these violations. Um, as noted, my name is Naomi Pena and I am the treasurer for the campaign. Um, I come before you to sort of address the violations and ask um, for it to be reviewed um, and lowered the violations or removed. Um, I was the treasurer for the campaign um, and as noted, there were the last two, um, I think the last, the last batch of the uh, disclosures or at least the, uh, I, my mind escapes me, the disclosures that needed to be submitted um, for, for verification um, and or submission. Unfortunately, um, I, for the first time that they were needed to be submitted, I was a victim of a domestic violence situation in my home and um, I needed to have that, I needed some more time. I did submit a report, a uh, police report noting that. Um, when I did submit them, I got a call noting that I had failed um, to make some notations in the scanning. Um, at the same time, when I got that call, I, a, I needed access to a high speed scanner because it was a stack of documents. And second, I have started um, a high powered, uh, a, a, a significant job in the city with a tech company. Um, and I thought that I took care of it, but unfortunately I wasn't aware that um, it was addressed until I got a call um, several months later, knowing that that wasn't received. Um, as it also results, I had a significant um, medical issue that I needed to, to address. Um, I had to take time off of work for um, my medical care, um, which included taking time off of work for almost a year to address that. I'm happy if needed to s submit documentation on that. Um, and it wasn't until I got a call from Mr. Gallagher knowing that um, it wasn't addressed that I then handled it. Um, so it wasn't intentional, absolutely not. It wasn't, um, you know, in malicious. It was just an unfortunate um, set of circumstances that completely escaped me. So um, because of that, I also asked that you consider it because it wasn't done in 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 
malice either. Um, that's all, and I appreciate you taking time out to consider that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gallagher, do you have any response? Uh, uh, no, not much. I, I mean, just to clarify that um, Ms. Pena is talking about the disclosure statement 16, um, which was due in January of 2018, and then the draft audit report. So it was two separate um, filings, but I think as she expressed, she had issues during both of those, but just to make it to clarify it for the board, but happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions by other members of the board? If not, uh, thank you very much. We will consider uh, what you have told us and deliberate and uh, let you know in a little while. All right. OK, the next uh, candidate uh, uh, scheduled to appear is uh, Robert Rodriguez. Uh, is Mr. Rodriguez and or uh, his representatives present? Uh, yes, That's, we're all here. But if, I'm just just gonna, if, you, if you want to wait, we just heard that the uh, the person who wants to appear in person is, is in the building, but there was some problem with the uh, notification system about guests. And so I'm just going to get, if we can just hold off for one minute, I'll just go, I mean, or you can start your presentation and I can go and deal with that. No, no, we, 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 we can just sit quietly for a moment. Uh, okay. After last night's storm, I'm sure a quiet moment would be welcomed by everybody. Okay, thank you very much. All right.
While we're waiting to actually for this, Richard Davis, I should, uh, as a matter of disclosure, note that in 2010, I made a contribution to Mr. Rodriguez's assembly campaign. And prior to that time, in my capacity as chair of the Randall's Island, then called Sports Foundation, I uh, had conversations and meetings, I don't remember how many, with Mr. Rodriguez when he was chair of the community board. Uh, thank you for that disclosure. Uh, the, we've previously discussed that internally, and uh, uh, we've concluded that uh, uh, Mr. Davis is not required to recuse himself uh, from consideration of this matter uh, because of those facts. So I just report that uh, our a staff member has gone down to the lobby to uh, let Ms. Sanders in, um, and so she should be back shortly. Okay. <laughs> oh, hopefully our trusty security will will sort this out. <laughs> Luckily, we set have the whole setup for her ready when she gets here, so she should be you know able to just walk right in and uh, and appear. The, uh, the last time we had an in-person meeting, uh, I had left my wallet at home. And the only idea I had when I got to security downstairs was my MTA card. I wasn't sure that was going to be sufficient, although it does have my picture on it, uh, since I do have a senior MTA card. <laughs> and, uh, that was seemed to be sufficient for them to let me in. Oh. That's good to hear, Chair. I'm glad. I'm glad that um, everyone worked that out. But hopefully, I did my part to extend our ability to do open meetings for the next few few months uh, during the pandemic. I, so, yes, uh, I'm sure we we and every other government agency uh, is appreciative of that. I think uh, we uh, 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 we reverted to sort of normal procedures a bit too early. Uh, of course, nobody had predicted uh, the Delta variant would get so serious so fast. Uh, and uh, it certainly is a, a, a great benefit, not only to our convenience, but to the public uh, to be able to continue uh, to hold uh, teleconference meetings uh, consistent with the open uh, meetings law. Uh, it's, uh, it's it, it would have been, I think, a problem for a lot of agencies uh, without that. And so we're we were very glad to uh, uh, to see that uh, happen, and we're, we thank all of the members of the assembly and senate and the governor uh, for uh, for making the, for making that change. And perhaps as we go forward, uh, we can think of a way of making this more permanent, while at the same time protecting uh, people's rights to attend, and uh, particularly the rights of the disabled. But I'm sure there's a workaround in the future uh, that uh, could enable uh, us to continue to have uh, teleconferenced uh, meetings because I think actually it better serves the purposes of the open meetings law as long as there's also an in-person option uh, for people who would like to attend in person or for people who uh, don't have a computer at home uh, in order to access the meeting. Uh, but uh, that's for another day. I think it's sound policy and keeps people safe, so I'll, I'll be pushing on my end. Very good. Uh, OK, we'll just wait a little bit longer for Amy to come back and, and get set up.
and we're just having a little bit of difficulty with the computer so that is what is going on i just want to let everyone know uh, thank you amy uh, while you're getting set up i think i'm going to need to move to a different place because i can see my uh iPad is running low and I need to plug it in, so I'm just going to move to a different location. I'll be with you in a second. Okay, great. No, you don't need to. Okay. 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 Rick, whenever you are ready. All right. Let me see if I can get back on visually. Yes, I. Oh, there's a light behind it. Let me go turn that off. Just one sec. All right, um, so uh, I'm going to ask uh, the uh, CFB staff to sort of uh, describe the issues before us, and then uh, Mr. Rodriguez, you and your representatives will have a chance to uh, address all of the issues. Uh, there may be some rebuttal, perhaps some questions from members of the board, uh, and after that we'll go into deliberations and uh, come back and announce our decision. Uh, so, Bethany, why don't you start us off by just describing the issues before us? Sure. Good morning. My name is Bethany Persky, General Counsel for the CFB, uh, also present today's Auditor Sonia Samoas. Before the board is the matter of the Robert Rodriguez campaign in the 2017 primary election for City Council District 8. Mr. Rodriguez was a participant in the program and received $96,600 in public funds. CFB staff is recommending that the board uh, find the following violations and assess penalties according to the penalty guidelines. Failing to demonstrate compliance with cash receipts reporting and documentation requirements, filing late disclosure statements, accepting an over the limit contribution, accepting a contribution from an unregistered political committee, making a cash expenditure greater than $100, failing to demonstrate that spending was in furtherance of the campaign, making impermissible post election expenditures and exceeding the expenditure limit. The campaign can test the recommended violation and penalty for exceeding the expenditure limit. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rodriguez. The floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, distinguished members of the campaign finance board. My name is Joseph Delermi, and I'm the treasurer for the New Yorkers for Robert Rodriguez. I'm accompanied today by New York State Assembly member Robert Rodriguez. As you know, he currently represents District 68 and has been an elected assembly member since 2010. Also in attendance today to assist the New Yorkers for Robert Rodriguez is Dawn Sanders, who um, thankfully was able to make it make her way up today and is a trooper for bearing with any sort of transportation issues. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, 
Miss Sanders served as the treasurer for the Friends of Robert J. Rodriguez, which was a New York State Board of Elections committee that was registered in 2010. <clears throat> During the 2017 election cycle, Assembly Member Rodriguez ran an unsuccessful election for City Council District 8. Our committee, New York's for Robert Rodriguez, has been assessed 90,000 in violation penalties. Over the past two years, we have provided receipts and documentation concerning nearly all of the transactions. And, with, and specifically with one of the violations that we're contesting today, that's an additional 137 transactions that we have had to attempt to explain and verify to the campaign, campaign finance board and its staff. But we're not here today to discuss every violation. Instead, we're here to address the nature of CFB's assessment against the city council committee and assembly member Rodriguez for violation eight and his desire to force assembly member Rodriguez to cease all expenses and expenditures from his other assembly related accounts. So while we do not dispute violations one through seven and the assessed penalties in connection with those violations, we are extremely unnerved by CFB's recommended filings, findings and assessment of violation eight, which according to the CFB amounts to $85,434 in total penalties. That this is at a three times penalty rate. So our issue to narrow it down is with $24,748.54 in expenditures that CFB alleges were in excess of the spending threshold. And that's what we contest and dispute these claims. Ms. Sanders, who's present today, can elaborate on the expenditures that were made to the benefit of Assembly Member Rodriguez's assembly account, including for the district leader election. But at this time, I would like to just take this opportunity to allow Assembly Member Rodriguez to say a few words on his behalf. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Bethany, and to the team at CFB. I do want to thank them um, for the work that they've put into this. While we, we've put in numerous um, submissions and, and, and literally months and months of work, they have done so as well. So I'm really grateful for the work that they've done. This is not easy. I feel that um, in, in this instance, it, was a, it is a complex situation with multiple campaigns happening where there was a district leader um, uh, position that I I was an incumbent for, as well as being the incumbent assembly member and pursuing the city council campaign. So much of our efforts have been around trying to demonstrate, um, you know, how um, um, the assembly um, expenses um, um, do not were not in furtherance of the campaign and allocate the appropriate expenses for the district leader campaign um, that was happening you know simultaneous with the city council so uh, that's just a little bit of the context of the backdrop of what we've been working on collectively to try to to, to demonstrate um, and, and and represent uh, i think one of the the challenges is that um you know that we've had is is with respect to incumbency and I know that the efforts of the campaign finance board and the and the resources that are provided are to mitigate the benefits of incumbency but I, I think in, in this instance the you know in uh, my incumbency is 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 the pendulum is swung and it seems to be uh, 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 something that's providing more of a penalty or an albatross than under normal circumstances um, so I think what we're going to hopefully try to do is is to provide additional um, detail and, and, and information about um, uh, assembly expenditures and, 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 and why they're not and, and shouldn't be um, you know, considered in furtherance of the, of the council campaign. And, and of course, beg for your consideration and, and, um, uh, um, and, and hopefully addressing a mitigation of the, uh, of the penalty. And I think one of the, the comments that, um, you know, that, that struck out in the, in the memo is um, the, the thought that the, some, of other, some other candidates were impacted by either um, uh, or unduly harmed as a result of uh, potential overspending. And, and I, I think some of the expenses that will show, you know, in, in no way, I, I think, impacted, you know, their campaigns. I think, you know, contextually, you know, speaking, um, you know, the you know, this was a campaign against you know someone who worked for 
uh, the, uh, the incumbent council members. So, you know, they they benefited from that incumbency um, as well, um, but they don't have to provide any supporting documentation for that because they, they weren't the actual candidate. Uh, so that might fall under the uh, rubrics of independent expenditures or some other, you know, context. But I just wanted to add that because I, I don't think in this instance that there was, um, you know, undue harm, um, it, it, you know, I, uh, to the alleged transactions. And then, of course, we, we think that they were uh, based on those transactions that they did not influence in, in any way, shape or form, um, you know, the outcome or, or um, you know, uh, were in furtherance of, of voters and uh, of, of, of pursuing voters. So um, hopefully we can, you know, compel the board to, to see um, uh, our position and to hopefully take action um, to at a minimum, you know, waive the penalties um, that that are generally associated. But we hope that they would look, you know, further at these expenses and, and recognize that, um, you know, they don't they do not fall into the category of overspending to benefit a campaign, but but really represent um, spending in a community that um, is is done by an incumbent and not in the furtherance of of votes or or pursuing. Um, um, you know, the electoral process, but really just supporting a community that um, that needs us. And, and as assembly members, we do not get discretionary funding. We do not get, um, you know, budgetary um, flexibility to really support our communities directly. Therefore, we do rely on our on our campaign accounts to do things like provide um, sponsorship for local community events, to provide food for different events, um, and to host um, you know, assembly related activities. And I think that's some of the things that we um, um, will we'll hopefully continue to outline. And uh, certainly appreciate your consideration. Um, because we have tried to you know, provide as much documentation in the previous rounds as possible. Um, but when when there's so many um, um, different um, um, records and, and, and so many um, um, corroborating um, pieces of information that are sometimes not easy to find that exceed the threshold that even the state finance board requires, you know, it has been a challenge to, to, to do that. Um, uh, to, I guess um, as extensively as 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 is being required, but we continue to to try and do that in all good faith efforts to to get to that point and and and, and show um, you know the, the that we've um, done our best to to put things in the appropriate buckets um, as as they needed to be re, uh, recorded and and as they were expended. But thank you all for your consideration, and I I do hope that you will consider our arguments and and assist us all in um, mitigating the penalties. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Assembly Member Rodriguez. Um, as you articulated, um, you know, we are definitely thank you thankful for your resources and you know and the assistance throughout this entire process. And as a committee, we understand the burden is to demonstrate that the expenditures were not made in connection with the city council uh, committee during that election cycle. And we have made good faith efforts to comply. And we respectfully believe that today's hearing, today's meeting is the best format for our city council committee to explain the circumstances behind certain expenditures and voice our concerns um, with respect to violation uh, number eight. So you know, first off, um, upon further investigation, the assembly committee acknowledges that they did not properly certify a district leader registration at the outset of assembly member Rodriguez's 2017 race for district leader. Uh, in hindsight, that was an error. It has since been rectified with the board of elections. The assembly committee has amended its statutory filings and is in good standing. The assembly committee did provide a petition and a certificate of declination. Ms. Sanders can address the specifics, but the lack of financial activity in either 2016 or 2017 was an error on behalf of the assembly committee and not the city council committee. Ms. Sanders believed that because the candidate withdrew from the race, perhaps the expenses might not apply to the district leader race. While certain filing errors were made, we believe it's been established by the proof of the documents that we've provided during this process that we submitted to the auditors and Ms. Persky that Assembly Member Rodriguez participated in an election for district leader 
and the expenses were warranted. Second, with respect to certain charges regarding Costco that has been flagged by the auditors and, and penalized in the, in the brief, it is our belief that we can identify and attribute a total of $2,982.15 to community events that Assembly Member Rodriguez's office supported. Um, I actually just want to list uh, a portion of that to certain uh, community events that Mr. Arrigas mentioned earlier in his statement that they have participated in, in the past, had participated in the current, uh, in the 2017 elections, election cycle. So for example, on um, April Mr. 10th, Hill. yes. Hi, it's Dawn. I Hi. just, um, I, I meant to just introduce myself before you got started yes. um, and apologize for being late. I wanted to be here in person because I am the treasurer for Friends of Robert J. Rodriguez. And I, um, over 2017, I did the same activities I do every year, election year or non-election year. So I wanted to be here in person because it's really important to me. I feel kind of like this um, rubs off on my reputation as well. And I just want you to know that everything that um, I did was were things that I do every year. Um, Every time I order food, I order food knowing that homeless people are going to come off the street. Every time um, there is an event, you know, my heart is in the right place. And so I started my career here at 100 Church in 90, 1996. And I just, you know, when I saw this was the address, I wanted to come down here and just pour my heart out to you because this is really important. It's very critical. Um, I take this very seriously um, and I'm, you know, quite sad that there's the implication that me feeding the community and these kinds of things um, is seen as as um, I've done something wrong. So I just want to give that intro before we get into the details. And again, sorry for being late. I apologize. I didn't, it's much harder to get into this building in, two, in 2021 than it was in 1996. So <laughs> please forgive me. Thank you. No problem. Great. Um, and kind of echoing what Ms. Sanders and Assemblymember Rodriguez has said, there are expend expenditures that feed the community. So, for example, April 10th, 2017, water, hot dogs, burgers, and buns were purchased for an event at a church, Iglesia Pentecostal El Maestro Church within Mr. Rodriguez's district. May 12, 2017, purchases in the amount of $286 spent on water, dogs, burgers, and buns at 109th Community Garden Barbecue. July 7, barbecue supplies as part of the Miles and Parker Housing Developments Barbecue event. July, uh, July 14, a week later, uh, food supplies for the Taft and Martin Luther King New York City Housing Authority development barbecue event. August 11, 2017, uh, barbecue, uh, barbecue food supplies for the uh, 1775 Madison Avenue housing development barbecue event. Just stating a couple of these purchases, I'm trying to establish that there's a clear fundamental pattern that these expenditures benefit the community as part of assembly members Barregas's duties. Um, it's important to, to kind of take a step back and realize that Assembly District 68 consists of East Harlem and sections of the South Bronx and is one of the poorest economic neighborhoods in New York City. Neighborhoods consist primarily of senior citizens and has the highest concentration of public housing in the state. Throughout, this, throughout his tenure as an elected official, Assemblymember Rodriguez donated, participated, and supported various non-political community events for his assembly district, providing food to an event that is not sponsored or organized by assembly in Rodriguez didn't result in the tangible or intangible benefit to his city council candidacy. He was literally feeding uh, individuals and his constituents and is truly a function of his duties and should not be subject to three times multiplier of a penalty. So as a result, we're going to 
we as a city council committee res uh, respectfully request that you reduce this expenditure amount by $2,982.15 and ask for an abatement of the associated statutory penalties of $8,946.45. Third, while we acknowledge that, the, that there was a likelihood of wage employee crossover between the assembly committee and the city council committee, um, such overlap is, is, is not impermissible. Uh, based on our previous explanations, some of the wage expenditures were attributed to normal assembly business, such as community events. Um, Ms. Sanders can certainly speak in more detail with respect to some of the wage expenditures, but I, I wanna flag a couple of those and just call that out just so you can understand that there's a pattern um, of what Mr. Rodriguez, Assembly Member Rodriguez and his assembly committee um, contributed to or you know, paid for. Um, so Harry Rodriguez, a $250 payment expenditure. This was uh, for district leader that, um, that had a Father's Day event each year and each year the assembly committee had been asked and had supported this event that Mr. Rodriguez, uh, Harry Rodriguez uh, hosted. Um, because of what's happened um, with this you know, violation eight, um, the committee, assembly committee has been careful not to support this event since the penalty assessment. Um, next, Joseph Solano, a $200 expenditure was a charitable donation for a back to school event that Mr. Solano held in partnership with St. Cecilia's Church. Mr. Solano holds no political or influential offices and has known Assembly Member Rodriguez since his youth. Um, it would be somewhat uncharacter of, of, Mr., uh, of Assembly Member Rodriguez to stop supporting St. Cecilia's Church um, as a result of or you know, because of his longstanding relationship. Uh, Dr. Betty Perez Rivera, $134.72 expenditure. This was actually in connection with an educational collaboration between Assembly Member Rodriguez and Dr. Per Dr. Uh, Rivera and Dr. Tiffany Rivera, which consisted of the Institute of Education for the Care of Chronic Diseases. What this particular expenditure was concerning was for an anti-smoking curriculum poster for children with asthma in East Harlem. Assembly member Rodriguez participated in this activity in his capacity as an assembly member and, and his involvement served no benefit to himself or city council primary candidacy. Um, I, think we, I think it's fair to state that East Harlem has one of the highest asthma rates in the country. And so this type of initiative and endeavor would be unusual for, for, for Mr. Uh, for Assembly Member Rodriguez to not support and to not you know, participate in. Um, the three times you know, penalty multiply is just not justified in this instance where Assembly Member Rodriguez is participating in a public good um, and a public good for his specific constituents. Um, we did uh, provide a copy of this particular poster, um, the curriculum poster. There's a PDF that we did provide. We are happy to provide it. Um, I believe Ms. Sanders has a copy and I also did uh, provide a copy to Ms. Persky um, should the board respectfully want to uh, view this. Um, given the circumstances of the pandemic, um, it was extremely challenging to contact and track down some of the other participants, wage participants in 2020 and 2021 to obtain their affirmations. Um, so in particular, um, Javier Abril and Patrick Mulligan, um, they have left the state. We have not been able to get in contact with them. Further, Ms. Alexandra Henry Vesalio, who has been a volunteer for two generations for Mr. Rodriguez's family, uh, has found herself unwell, and we as determined as a committee not to um, track and ask her to sign an affirmation for non-city council work. So while we 
do believe that all those uh, these particular wage employees were part of assembly matters. What we're going to do is we're going to just respectfully ask that reduce the expenditure amount by five hundred eighty-four dollars and seventy-two cents, um, and an abatement of five thousand two hundred seventy-nine dollars and sixteen cents in the associated statutory penalties. Um, we understand that that, and we respectfully accept if there is some responsibility. Um, uh, because we have not provided a full burden of providing affirmations for those three wage earners um, for their respective expenses. Uh, four, there is multiple non-political organization community events expenditures. And as Mr. Uh, Assemblymember Rodriguez articulated in his statement, um, being an elected official, there is a certain expectation and obligation to um, provide public good, to be involved in the community. Um, and the community looks for those type of involvement from their elected officials. So we wanted to provide some clarity today as it relates to some of the non-political organization community events that both fall within his district and outside of his district. Um, but they're all connected exclusively with Assembly Member Rodriguez's assembly duties and had no benefit for his city council duties. One, unity in the community. It was a bar barbecue community event that's supported each year by the assembly committee. It focused on a gun violence intensified in East Harlem and the group was active in trying to stem violence through positive community outreach. Precinct Council PSA 5, a non-political contribution related to the organization's night out event. A police service area five, that's what their acronym stands for, serves as the New York City Housing Authority development and certain is a non-political agency. And as a non-political agency, you're unable to make endorsements. So the assembly committee by making a contribution, there was no benefit for his city council uh, run. Um, there was nothing in furtherance or benefit to this. Was him providing his you know, providing contribution to an organization within his district, the Black Institute, a purchase of gala uh, uh, gala tickets, the annual gala that they host. The Black Institute is a five hundred one c three. It's a think tank based in Brooklyn. Their, their purpose is to, pr to promote racial equity by advancing innovative uh, data policy solutions on behalf of African Americans and Black immigrant communities. Again, a 501c3, they don't endorse candidates. So there was no benefit for Mr. Rodriguez, uh, Mr. Rodriguez a city council candidacy. Emergency Rights Incorporated, a South Bronx, New York organization acts as a critical safety net in terms of domestic violence. They inform residents of their private and government resources available to them and collaborate with community leaders, not-for-profits and volunteers to enhance the quality of life. The assembly committee supported the community engagement of this group as part of the Puerto Rican Day Parade. and provided visibility on a particular missing person case that was of, of notoriety within the community. Um, to think that there should be a penalty, you know, three times, you know, multiplier for this type of contribution, which I have in terms of $250, is something that we're just unnerves us. Um, PSMS 57, Johnson Leadership Academy, East Harlem grade school contribution for the Puerto Rican Day Parade. Assembly Member Rodriguez, who is Puerto Rican, I do want to add, um, participates in the Puerto Rican Day Parade as part of his official capacity as an elected official. I believe most politicians participate in their official capacity. Um, so the school had participated in the past five years and the, the students look forward to it. it. It would be unreasonable and unusual for assembly member Rodriguez to, to not provide a contribution that could benefit the school and in fact cover the cost of cleaning uniforms and providing transportation, transportation for those students to their event. New York Police Department, 25th Precinct Community Council. Another non-political contribution related to the organization's night out events. Um, again, 
try to make that distinct, you know, there's a clear distinction about, you know, uh, an expenditure towards um, a district organization that serves no political purpose. Uh, National Association of Each One Teach One Online Academy. This was a donation in support of a non-political youth basketball tor- tournament in furtherance of its mission, which provided nonprofit mentoring and counseling for after-school programs. As a, as a 501c3, it does not provide endorsements. Thus, there's no benefit or advantage that can be earned by this contribution. I did want to also flag some other non-district assembly contributions that are cur- that CFB has flagged. Um, some are located within New York City, but others are completely outside of New York City. Uh, some may be familiar to the board. Three Parks Independent Democratic Club, an Upper West Side New York City political group that endorses and works for candidates that advocate for a progressive democratic agenda, for local, state, and federal issues. No endorsement was provided, And given that the association does not represent City Council 8 District, um, we argue that there's no benefit or advantage that could be earned by this contribution. West Harlem Democrats, they are a political group that endorse and work for candidates and advocates for a progressive democratic agenda for local, state, and federal issues as well. No endorsement was provided and they were not in City Council 8 District. The Parents Association of Governor State School. It was a donation for a barbecue event hosted by a 501c3 parent association that focuses with children with development disabilities. As a 501c3, they do not endorse. So in any existence of benefit or advantage earned in assembly members, Rodriguez's city council candidacy, I think is eliminated. Further, as a particular point, uh, Ms. Willie Mae Goodman, serves as the head of this organization. And like many others in her community had known assembly member Rodriguez since he was a child volunteering at her events. She helped expose and close down the Willowbrook facilities, saving her own daughter and countless other children with disabilities. Her her advocacy helped many of those children become adults, including her daughter. Assembly member Rodriguez also sponsors a panel in association with this organization at the Black and Puerto Rican Legislative Council in Albany. It would be highly unusual for Assembly Member Rodriguez to not support this organization. American State Legislators for Gun Violence. Um, <laughs> I think the name says it uh, speaks for itself. Um, a national independent nonpartisan coalition of legislators who are sharing strategies for reducing gun violence. Um, Assemblymember Rodriguez participated in this activity in his capacity as an assembly member and his involvement served no benefits or had any correlation with his city council primary candidacy. And in fact, the organization doesn't even endorse candidates. So to sum up with respect to these organizations, um, we respectfully as the city council request that the board reduce the expenditure amount by $3,845 and an abatement of $11,535 in the associated uh, statutory penalties. The assessment, as I mentioned earlier, really has a chilling effect, a real chilling effect on the ability of Assemblymember Rodriguez's uh, Assembly uh, Committee to be a partner in the community. Number five, um, Ama Cocina. Real quickly, uh, it was a very small $64 charge. However, it was an Albany-based restaurant located at 4 4 Sheridan Avenue in Albany, New York. Um, Food and restaurant expenses are common expenditures and the assembly committee does not reimburse staff members for food, travel costs and hotel lodging. Um, I do wanna point out the proximity of city council district in Albany, 144 miles. So we respectfully ask that the board reduced the expenditure amount by said $64 in an abatement of $192 in the associated statutory penalties. Six, Hunter College. A facility fee for a senior summit assembly event at Hunter College, the Silverman School Social Work. Uh, assembly member Rodriguez participated in this summit in his capacity as an assembly member and his involvement served no benefit to himself or his city council candidacy. 
And one thing I do want to point out about this particular that I had to do a double, triple take. The expenditures were October 11th, 2017, which technically is a month after the primary was that Assembly Member Rodriguez uh, was unsuccessful in. So here's a charge that for a, a summit that is being attributed to city council that really has no rational, just, you know, just basis for being um, in um, or allocated to the city council committee. After dark, this was a Mother's Day event hosted by Felix Leo Campos of La Foliza Project. Um, its mission is to join neighborhood stakeholders and community investors you know, to create live events featuring small business and arts cultural sectors. Um, the, the city council committee respectfully requests that the board reduce the expenditure amount by 500 and an abatement of 1500 in associated statutory capitals. However, we recognize, because we're reasonable, we recognize that this particular organization is located within district. So within the guidelines that CFB has been, has been follows and, and, and needs to um, determine penalties, we, we recognize that this is an in-district expenditure. So we, we would be, um, we respectfully, uh, recognize that if the board did want to attribute half of the expenditure towards a city council primary account, um, we would um, be receptive to that. However, we would still respectfully request that any penalties be abated as that is just a chilling effect and, uh, and a punitive punishment for a contribution uh, to this type of organization. Hope Community Incorporated. Um, the assembly committee maintained a master lease with Hope Community uh, dating back to 2015. A lease which Ms. Sanders does have a copy of, and I did provide Ms. Persky a copy uh, this morning, has, um, has been provided as well as the sublease for the particular city council committee. Um, it was first made available during the inquiry in January 2019. Um, the city council committee paid its fair share for the use of its space. Um, further, the assembly committee had no requirement or reason to shut down the campaign office, the assembly office for the year of 2017. The city, the city council committee thus respectfully requests that the board reduce the expenditure amount by the amount of this expenditure, $2,842.62 and the abatement of the associated statutory penalties in the amount of $8,527.86. And then somewhat associated with that is the Con Ed utility bills um, that keep the, keep the lights on and the electric on. Um, uh, Mr. I just, the last one, where is that on the list, the 2,800? Uh, $2,842.62. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, I, I see yes, it, yeah. Hope Community Incorporated. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Con Edison, and again, associated with the lease, and Miss Miss Sanders was kind enough to bring some statements today um, as proof that this is a friends of Robert J. Rodriguez assembly expense. Um, and it was the responsibility of the tenant and by extension, the assembly committee. Um, and as the treasurer of the city council committee, I can tell you I was not privy, not shared, or never had any, um, any dealings with any sort of billing for Con Ed. We were a sub -lacy. So as a so as a respectful request, we we ask that the board reduce this expenditure amount by the amount of the total amount of the bill, five hundred eighty-five dollars and ninety-two cents, 
and request an abatement of $1,757.76 in the associated statutory penalties. I did want to also point out that there was a expenditure for H&M Arden Home of Harlem. Um, this expenditure is related to a purchase for art frames currently located in the assembly member's district office at his 115th street office. Um, we tried to track down a receipt, but as you can imagine, it, as Mr. As assembly member Rodriguez mentioned previously, you know, some records are just very difficult. Um, especially as it relates to uh, assembly um, documents. Um, only visitors to the assembly office could see these installations and those visitors were only present for the assistance they needed from the legislative body or the constituent services. The artwork in itself was salvaged posters from the state legislative caucuses from previous years and had no relationship to the city council. So, we would respectfully request that the $435.52 be removed in an abatement of $1,306.56 in the associated statutory penalties. Next, uh, Carmen Arroyo for assembly. This expenditure was related to a contribution which is common for elected officials to endorse who are running for elected offices. Um, especially those running in the assembly, along with assembly member Rodriguez. Um, we respectfully re request that the $500 be removed and the abatement of $1,500 in associated statutory penalties. Next, Brian Benjamin for New York. Again, this was an expenditure related to, that is common for elected officials to endorse candidates who are working for, uh, you know, who work within the assembly and, and who are running for assembly next to, you know, Mr. Rodriguez, assembly member Rodriguez. Um, so as a result, we respectfully request $1,000 of the expenditure amount to be removed and 3,000 in associated statutory penalties. Next, Democratic Club of El Barrio. This expenditure was related to a contribution which is again common for elected officials. Um, one thing that I will state is that we understand that this being an in-district organization, we recognize that the board may want to attribute a portion of the expenditure towards city council primary uh, account or committee. Uh, we would still respectfully request that the penalties be abated in its entirety, as this is a normal common contribution for assembly members. Next, El Nuevo Creed Democratic Club. Similar to the above, um, and we would respectfully ask that the expenditure amount of 250 be removed and the abatement of 750 and associated statutory penalties. The next one, Schromberg Democratic Club which I do want to flag and provide a little bit more detail and context. And please, Ms. Sanders or Mr. Uh, Assembly Member Rodriguez, please feel free to elaborate a little bit on, on this particular expenditure, as I think it does warrant you know, certain context. Um, as Assembly Member Rodriguez was the former district leader and actually the startup advisor for this Democratic Club. So in other words, basically at the founding level, um, uh, the assembly committee was often supported the work of this particular club. This expenditure was related to a contribution, which is common for elected officials. And in particular, one where assembly member Rodriguez was involved at the founding. Um, as a result, um, we would respectfully request that the expenditure amount be removed um, in the amount of $4,400 and abatements of 13,200 in associated statutory penalties. And then, um, I'll move on to the next unless there's anything else that Ms. Sanders or Senator Member Rodriguez would like to add. Uh, I'm gonna jump in. I was gonna wait till the very end, um, but um, I thought this might be a good time to sort of seem to be more than halfway through there um, 
detailed analysis, which is very helpful, and I don't wish to cut you off. You mm -hmm. should feel free to proceed. Um, but, but just backing up from the weeds just for a moment to the larger picture and <clears throat> relating to some of the policy arguments that you've made and that uh, uh, Assemblymember Rodriguez uh, also made um, about people who are in one elective office running for a city office at the same time. Much of your argument is essentially of the, in the direction that um, these are normal expenditures for an assembly member, and indeed they are consistent with expenditures uh, that he and others have made in the past uh, in connection with their assembly duties. And I'm wondering whether in that connection it would be helpful um, and I'd also like Ms. Persky's view of this. Um, if we saw the budget or the filing for the assembly committee in prior years, so we could see whether there was a, a significant jump in these kinds of expenditures or new, new expenditures that hadn't appeared uh, in the past. Uh, because it seems to me you have said on a couple occasions that this was purely for the assembly purpose and had no benefit uh, uh, for the city council race. But I'm not sure that's the standard. That is to say, being an incumbent obviously does have some benefit, as Mr. Rodriguez has already pointed out. Uh, and in many cases, it's a, it's a, a lawful benefit, even though it may be viewed by some as unfair. Um, and so it's, it does seem to me, and again, I'd like to hear both sides respond to this, um, that it might be helpful to just sort of see what the world looked like in 2015 or 2016 or 2014. Fortunately, Assemblymember Rodriguez has been there for a long time. And uh, so presumably we've got some prior evidence on this, uh, but it's not part of the record. And I'm just wondering whether you all think that this might be a, a useful way of uh, trying to uh, back up from the all of the very very detailed specifics, which are helpful, uh, to just get a larger view of, of what's going on here. Uh, Ms. Persky, if you're yeah. speaking, I can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. now I can. Um, um, uh, yeah, so. I would say that what you're describing is of, of limited relevance because really we're, we're not talking about um, the standard is not whether these are normal assembly expenditures uh, or whether they benefit the community or whether they were, you know, there's, this is not about uh, passing any kind of moral judgment on the expenditures themselves. Um, and it's not about even whether they were intentionally made in order to benefit the city council campaign. The fact is that under the law, there's simply a different standard that applies uh, when you're a sitting office holder, if you're running for another office, if you're running for a city office, expenditures under the law that you make from any committee are presumed to be in furtherance of your next election. And that's because even if you don't necessarily intend them specifically to benefit the council election, um, even if they're regular expenditures that you would ordinarily make, they have the effect of benefiting that council election when they're made, you know, roughly in the same district, the same area, that community that's being benefited by those um, expenditures, those constituents, those are the voters who are voting in that city council election. Um, and so there doesn't need to be any kind of intent to circumvent the limit. There doesn't need to be any sort of malice, anything like that at play. Under the law, it's very clear the expenditures are presumed to be in furtherance of the campaign because he was running for city council at the same time. And that's why 2017 is a different year fundamentally than any preceding year. So, so let, let me stay, if I, if I could just, uh, one follow-up question, then Rich, why don't you jump in? Um, so is, is it your position that the law requires a sitting assemblyman who's running for the city council to refrain from making expenses that he's made in prior years as, in, as part of what he views as his normal community outreach and service, uh, that he must stop making those expenditures in the year that he's running for city council? Not necessarily, but they either need to be factored into the spending limit that applies to the other office that is being sought, or there needs to be specific documentation uh, and information demonstrating that those expenditures were for the sole purpose um, of the assembly committee or office, 
um, we there's a number of expenditures that are all detailed in the board memo where we did accept that information and documentation when it was provided. The ones that remain in this in the limit uh, in the calculation are ones for which that information and documentation was not sufficiently provided um, to the extent that that the campaign is seeking to provide it for the first time today. I can't speak to the merits of it because I haven't looked at it because it's being provided for the first time today. Um, as the board knows, as the campaign knows, the rules provide that. Uh, documentation being provided for the first time at this point in, in the enforcement cycle uh, is to be disregarded absent extraordinary circumstances. I would argue not only do those extraordinary circumstances not apply here, but the campaign has had even more opportunities than other campaigns ordinarily do to provide documentation. Uh, in addition to the original enforcement notice where several extensions were granted, there was a period of time last year between April and September, uh, five months where the campaign was given additional time to submit more documentation from Ms. Sanders. Um, that's on, on top of the extensions that were granted the enforcement notice. That's outside of our normal extension policy, and that's an accommodation that was granted to this campaign. And then subsequent to that, there was an, a revised enforcement notice that went out in November. Um, they submitted additional documentation at the end of January. So there has been more than ample opportunity to provide this documentation, which is from an election that happened four years ago. Uh, so I would argue that it would be not appropriate to accept anything that's being submitted for the first time today. Yeah, I understand there's a documentation problem, and I'm I'm sort of avoiding that for the moment. I, I just just wanted to get your view though about the meaning of this soul that it's for the sole benefit uh, of uh, the assembly duties and and no benefit uh, to the city council campaign. Is that I'm just not sure how to apply that uh, to some of the not for profit or even political organizations, particularly those that are outside the district. Um, do, do you just briefly want to give us some guidance as to uh, how you draw that line and why you permitted some of these for which other documentation was permitted? Uh, because I'm frankly a little bit at a loss uh, as to how to apply this standard. Yeah, it's, it's highly fact specific, I would say. Uh, before yes. you answer, because I might want to piggyback so you can include, because uh, what I'm concerned about is for the implication that if it's an ordinary expense meeting, they make it every year. There's a barbecue that for you know, some school, and every year they've given it. Could, do we create a situation where, in when you're running for the city office and you don't give it, you actually are penalizing the campaign because it would be perceived? What do you mean you're not supporting us this year? You, in other words, if if it is an ordinary expenditure. Do you have a situation where you're actually uh, creating, a, in a perverse way, a negative impact on the campaign if if it's if, they, if this is the year you can't give what you normally give? You're referring to the assembly campaign. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I, I would I would say that's certainly a, a an impact. You know, Richard. I mean, you know, to think that for a year we wouldn't participate in the Puerto Rican Day Parade, you know, or some of the other activities that we do is it's you know, certainly, um, you know, a burden that non-incumbents don't 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 have to even face or 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 think about. So I think that puts us, you know, at a disadvantage. And well, well, yeah, yes, and no. I mean, let's let's not go too far here, mm -hmm. because if you're a non-incumbent running in your district and you don't participate in the Puerto Rican Day Parade, you're out of your mind. So I understand that some of the, some of these expenditures that you've done in the past, you would normally do as a campaign measure. But then there are others that perhaps you wouldn't. Uh, you do it because these people you care about personally, they've been your constituents for a long time. It's not always easy to make that distinction. Uh, uh, I, I just, again, to piggyback on, on Rich's piggyback on my question, what, what, what I'm concerned about here is that we don't impose an obligation on every sitting assembly member who's running for the city council that if they want to continue their ob their prior commitments, they have to count them as campaign expenditures. On the other hand, I'm not, I don't want to give them an unfair advantage when they spend money on something that any candidate is right mind would spend money on, like the Puerto Rican Day Parade. So, so it's, it's, it's a very hard uh, uh, knot to untie. Uh, back to you, Ms. Persky, as to how you would sort this out. 
Uh, yeah, and, and I want to be clear again that this is not the rule is not they are not permitted to make these types of expenditures. They simply need to be factored into the budget, and, and a lot of it is fact specific. Sometimes there can be a prorating um, for some of the the employees. They were able to show okay, certain of the services went to the assembly committee and certain went to the city council committee. When we have documentation and a breakdown of that prorating, we can apply it. Um, to the spending limit accordingly. What we don't have in the cases of the expenditures that remain in the calculation is the means by which to do that. Um, you know, C3 donations and expenditures for community events and contributions to other political committees, these are all explicitly campaign related under the Campaign Finance Act. And the law is very clear that for your they're attributed to your next election, whenever you're next a candidate. Um, it, it's it's frankly black and white, so we don't need to even litigate really how much of a benefit actually accrued to the city council campaign. campaign. Now, if, for example, you mentioned um, an event that was held that's, that's located within the assembly district outside of the city council district, that is a piece of evidence we would consider. Um, to my knowledge, we don't have that information. And again, I haven't looked at what's been sent to me this morning. To my knowledge, we don't have anything like that for any of the expenditures that remain in the calculation. But that is a data point that's an example of something we would consider that we would unattribute it from the expenditure limit calculation. If I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's Dawn. Yeah. I just want to add something to the end of that when it's appropriate. Go ahead. So, so yeah, I um, just want to follow up that when the when this audit came about, first of all, I had was not involved with the city council um, campaign. Afterwards, I helped with the recount as a volunteer, but I was not day by day asking them. How much are you spending on this? Because I have this event, this other event. And in 2018, I think, or beginning of 2019, I provided every single bank statement for this committee, right? Even New York State Board of Elections does not want to see my bank statement. So I was very transparent. I gave everything that I had. And I was kind of not really sure. I, at the beginning, honestly, I didn't realize that I had done anything wrong. I just gave the bank statements like, yeah, I, I went to Costco. I did this. I did that. You know, so I was being very transparent and probably a little naive because I didn't at all think that these types of expenses that we provide every year would become an issue. And just want to, you know, state a fact, this is not an election year. I have at least three orders from Costco on my phone for family days this weekend. So we set a precedent. I don't know if it was right or wrong. I know there is a lot of very stingy candidates that get people cheese and crackers when they have events. But you know, we set a precedent even before we 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 ran that if we're going to have you come out from your home, we're going to feed you and we're going to take care of you. We're going to offer you services. And every year we get the same requests every single year. I'd be happy to go all the way back to 2010 and show you each year how much we gave. And, and not only that, I'm not an easy treasurer. I say no a lot. And there are people I've been dying to say no to, but because they are doing the right thing, we continue to support them. And so I just wanna point out that I'm definitely not the treasurer that just does whatever they're told. Like I had a request for a $300 cake. I mean, that was more than my wedding cake. I'm not paying for a $300 cake. So the point is that, you know, when I go to Costco or I go one of these places, it's really just for the events that I've done before. And I really didn't get involved at all with the city council um, race. So I just want to put that out there Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And, and we're, we're all aware of the fact that we're dealing with two separate committees operating under two different sets of laws. Um, so that, Brings me to another question from Ms. Persky. Have we ever had a case anything like this before, uh, where uh, uh, you know it involves the intersection of a sitting uh, state uh, uh, official running for the city council, where uh, uh, we looked to the expenditures of his state committee, uh, and if so, was it? Uh, you know, tell tell me a little bit about what our precedents are in this area, because I want to. We'll probably discuss this in deliberations, but I want I want to give uh, uh, the the uh, I'll call them the Rodriguez camp an opportunity uh, to respond uh, to any precedent that you may have in mind. So please tell us. Uh, yeah, it's I would say it's fairly common um, for you know a state office holder to run for city office, and then um, we we use the state board of elections reporting to attribute expenditures made by that other committee that remains active. Um, I don't have a specific 
precedent in mind. I think that the prior reporting is something that our auditors look at to kind of get the full picture. Um, but again, it's never, to my knowledge, been determined to be dispositive that if an expenditure was made in prior years, that that meant it wasn't in furtherance of the current election. Um, just because again, under the law, the presumption shifts as soon as you run for a different office. While we're going over all this, I just wanted to clarify one point that's actually unrelated to this discussion. Am I correct? that there's about 4,000 of over the limit expenditures that are unrelated to the state committee um, and that uh, because it, the, the penalty is based on 28,000 and change and the state committee issue is 24,000 and change. That's correct. Um, do you want to address uh, Ms. Persky's point, which is a troubling point, that um, some of the facts and arguments that you are presenting here are being presented for the first time. You've had an awful lot of time uh, to respond uh, to the draft audit report. Um, uh, we don't ordinarily, you know, conduct an evidentiary hearing. Uh, uh, we expect that people uh, will have submitted uh, all of the documents and facts you know, prior uh, to argument and. Uh, we're hearing an awful lot of stuff for the first time today. Not that it isn't valuable, but it's not really consistent with our normal procedures. And I, I think you you need to address that. I can start. Um, you know, this has definitely been an ongoing process um, with respect to our prior disclosures during this process. Uh, Ms. Sanders has provided very large volume of books of files documents, receipts. We've tried to call um, as much information based on 137 transactions. That is strictly just for this particular violation. Um, 137 transactions, which originally started out at $79,495 worth of expenditures that CFB assessed and said, provide us, you know, every document, any, you know, explanation, clarification, why this does not uh, provide in furtherance of city council. At this point today, we have called that down to 20, you know, basically the amount that we're disputing, the 24,000. So that's over 50,000 that we have, you know, through various waves and, and we requested those extensions because it does take time. Mind you, this is not, when we're not contesting or disputing the actual transactions that the city council as treasurer, me personally, that I had my hands in, that I have personally can vouch and verify. This is a whole separate bucket of transactions that city council committee has no visibility on. And thankfully to, you know, with the work that, that Ms. Sanders has provided has been able to track down. I can't speak personally as the treasurer of these other expenses outside of knowing that I did not provide any sort of check. We did not co-mingle. We did not collaborate during the election cycle. In fact, we have two separate bank accounts. Friends, um, uh, Friends of Robert Rodriguez is a city bank my uh, New York, uh, New Yorkers for Rodriguez was a spring bank, a local bank uh, merchant. So there was no commingling. There was no kind of collaboration. So the the documents, once the draft audit report came in, there was this Exhibit 6A that flagged 80,000 worth of expenditures that needed to be verified um, and provided. That is a very, you know, voluminous request in addition to the other violations again we're just talking about one violation um there is a total of seven violations and there was a lot of and this is all part of the normal process which we acknowledge and you know respect and we you know, provided in compliance so we definitely um felt that we tried to provide everything that we could there are still some items that we've uncovered that we feel could be beneficial and we do think that this, that the expenditures as well as the penalties that are being assessed are extremely hidden circumstances to present this. We do see this format are 
our conversation and discussion with the board today as being the proper format to discuss this. Because we understand that the law sees this as a very black and white issue. However, the, the meeting today, the distinguished members of the board have the ability to look at kind of the context and the reasoning and see kind of the challenging dilemma that, that faces us today, where you know this is a potential punitive measure. Um, and potentially, if, if these penalties and expenditures are not abated, potentially you are penalizing a sitting assembly member that has in good faith provided expenditures towards his assembly, towards elected duties, and the city council, the city council committee is being penalized for that through New York City Campaign Finance Board. So there's that kind of, you know, for, for basically good faith, reasonable expenses. There is no cars, there's no outrageous expenditures. These are all part of, of you know, common fundamental um, you know, expenditures that are for his constituents. Um, we welcome the opportunity to continue to provide context or provide additional support. I understand that this format, um, this board meeting, you know, is a is is typically not the type of evidentiary body that would look at documents in it itself. But we do believe that this is such a uh, interesting and challenging dilemma for our committee. Um, given some of the facts, the specific facts of this of this situation. Well, you've gone over a lot of them in great detail. Uh, my sense is that I cut you off and that you might have <laughs> some more, although I think we certainly have a sense of mm -hmm. where you're going with these. Um, I, I'm going to ask my fellow board members whether you feel it would be beneficial uh, to continue with some of the detail or whether uh, we've think we've heard enough uh, at this point and uh, should wrap up. Uh, uh, does anybody have a feeling about that? And uh, if we're not going to hear a lot more detail, I'm going to give you each a couple minutes to, to sum up a, a, at the end anyway. Uh, but in terms of continuing down this list, I don't know how close you were to the end, but um, uh, and I was following it really quite carefully, uh, but I did think I, I, I broke in when I did because I thought it was time for a change of pace. Uh, anybody have any uh, thoughts about this? I mean, there's rich. Uh, look, if there's if there's a particular expenditure which is uh, you want to discuss, which is not based on the same sort of what I'll call and, and the chair is called the policy issue of this is a normal expenditure. This is when we normally do. I, I'd ask you to bring that to our attention. Otherwise, I think it's a, it's, it's a more generic issue that we just have to think through how we want to approach. No, I, I um, unless uh, I think we won't belabor, or, we won't belabor yeah. the, the point and the and, and the indulgence that the board has given us thus far. Yes. I think we have submitted, you know, some additional detail in writing about the ones mm -hmm. that we have, um, you know, issue with and, and provided explanation. So I, I think, you know, we'll we'll let that stand and, and allow you to deliberate on that. And if I can just add one one last thing, I just want to make clear that I am very thankful and grateful for the penalty that has been removed. And, you know, I was in this process many, many, many years ago, and Ms. Persky was still with this organization. And, you know, honestly, I'm, you know, I'm grateful that Ms. Persky is the one with us because I know that she has the knowledge and experience. And so I just want to thank you for your time. But I want to guarantee you that I broke many nights <laughs> on this audit. I, I I spent many many nights. I um, rescued a pigeon one day. I was I was <laughs> and I just want you to know I really did um, do a lot of due diligence. And you know some of this stuff was just so difficult to find. But I did give the entire bank statements over. Like here's everything we spent, every single dollar where it went. And I didn't think ahead to some of these these um some of these like events special events and and so on like i can find certain things in my email con ed i had to i had to hack back into my con ed account to go back to 2017 and find those those bills so again it's just an, an issue of just more time um necessary but but beyond, beyond that i just want to be very clear that i'm very thankful um for miss persky and her staff and the work that they've done 
and the amounts that they have um, reduced. Well, we, we, we all always appreciate Ms. Persky's uh, uh, work on, on behalf of the board, which is always first rate. And I'm going to give her a, a minute to, to say anything further she wants to say. But I, I, I want to point out the, you know, the dilemma here, because I understand from your perspective, your being Assembly Member Rodriguez and, and your representatives, um, that uh, you feel like you were doing your ordinary job as an Assembly Member. And I also understand Ms. Persky's perspective that, um, yeah, but the law places constraints. Um, and uh, as a policy matter, it's a very tough area to limit the advantages of incumbency, particularly when it comes to the expenditure of money, uh, 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 so that there's a fair and level playing field uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, uh, allowing assembly members to do their job uh, while they're running for another office. Uh, and the, the law, at least as Ms. Persky interprets it, and we're going to have to scratch our heads and look at it carefully ourselves, uh, takes a pretty tough position, uh, creates a certain presumption uh, that mm -hmm. isn't easy to rebut. Uh, I understand you've made good faith efforts to rebut uh, some, uh, some of it, and uh, we're just going to have to go struggle and uh, see how we uh, how we come out on this. Uh, Ms. Persky, I'm going to give you the last word. OK, uh, and I appreciate the kind words. I, I just want to say again that um, we were not disputing at all Ms. Sanders' claim that she didn't think she was doing anything wrong. In fact, she was not doing anything wrong per se. Um, and, and again, it's, it's not that these expenditures were, were wrong or inappropriate. Um, the law simply presumes them to be in furtherance of the, of the city council campaign. And I would note that, and this is in Exhibit 7 to the board memo, um, that the city campaign was instructed by CFB staff in January 2017 that any expenditures made by this state committee would be attributed to the spending limit for city council. Um, so they were, in fact, on notice as of that point that, that this was um, going to be the result. So I just want to note that and again just point out this is not we you know chair Schaefer you mentioned prior campaigns where this has been an issue where there's been a state committee active um, I can think of at least one example where the evidence suggested that it was actually being used as an intentional um, circumvention of the expenditure limit in that instance the staff recommended aggravating factors to be found in an increased penalty that's not the case here and we're not making that recommendation here our, our recommendation is consistent with the standard penalty under the guidelines okay thank you very much um, I think at this point uh, we're going to uh, go into deliberations uh, and uh, we're going to sign off and uh, sign back on to the my fellow members of the board. You've been extremely patient through a long uh, but interesting argument. And so when uh, I hereby give you a five minute break uh, before we sign on to our uh, deliberations and uh, I'll see you in five minutes. OK, thank you all. We'll be back in a little while. And I, I will share with the people who are remaining that the board will go into deliberations and then come back and take a vote on the matters that we heard this morning and other matters. Um, you can wait and hear the decision or the attorney who was uh, working on your case can will contact you immediately after the board meeting. OK, thank you, Amy. See you all in a little while. Thank you. Thank you. Um,
All right, uh, are we all back? Not quite. Amy, you'll let me know. Yeah, I, I'm still waiting for two board members. Okay, we are all here. All right, um, so uh, we have uh, duly deliberated on the uh, matters of the candidates who appeared uh, uh, today, uh, and uh, I'll take these one at a time. Uh, so the first is uh, we propose uh, with respect to uh, uh, Dacia Imperiale, a candidate uh, for city council district number one in 2017. Uh, we propose to uh, find the following violations and impose the following penalties. Uh, one, uh, failure to report transaction at $59. Two, filing a late disclosure statement, uh, violation, no penalty. Three, failing to demonstrate that spending was in furtherance of the campaign, uh, $132. Four, failing to respond to the draft audit report, $1,251 for a total penalty of $1,442. Uh, I move the approval of those findings and uh, penalties. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Opposed? Abstention? The motion carries. Uh, next, uh, uh, Robert Rodriguez, a candidate for city council, uh, district number eight in 2017 also. Uh, the board proposes to make, uh, to find the following violations and impose the following penalties. One, failing to demonstrate compliance with cash receipts reporting and documentation requirements. $1,031. Two, filing late uh, disclosure statements, $100. Three, filing, I'm sorry, accepting an over the limit contribution, $125. Four, accepting a contribution from an unregistered political committee, $125. Five, Making a cash expenditure greater than $100, $156. Six, failing to demonstrate that spending was in furtherance of the campaign, $2,681. Seven, making impermissible post election expenditures, $657. Eight, exceeding the expenditure limit, $32,000 for total penalties of $36,875. Uh, I move the approval of uh, those findings and penalties. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. And I'll note that for both those two motions, the board member Moskowitz, who um, is unable to, uh, his audio is not working, um, has typed his uh, I vote in the chat. Thank you. And so the vote on both was unanimous. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, the next item on our agenda, let me just pull up our agenda and I'll be. Uh, is uh, we have some past uh, payments to ratify. Is that right, Amy? Um, the first order of business, yes, is to ratify a um, uh, the board the uh, 
board chair's approval under the delegation by the board of a 709 petition from uh, candidate John Williams. Uh, does someone else want to make that motion since we're ratifying my action? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. And Larry was voted aye by Sora okay. in the chat. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 nays, abstentions, uh, the motion carries. Uh, next, Amy. The next order of business is to ratify the chair's approval of uh, the pay public funds payments made on August 12th. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. And Mr. Mosk, as I saw in the chat, and I. Thank you. Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, that motion carries. Uh, next, uh, uh, Amy, would you explain uh, the next item on uh, lifting uh, the expenditure limit? Uh, the, the final item is the staff is recommending that the board vote to lift entirely the spending limit in the general election for Council District 17 uh, based on one candidate's having raised or spent more than three times the spending limit. Uh, I move uh, that we uh, provide that relief. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? The motion carries. I think we've completed our business for today. Thank you all very much. We're going to, I'm going to move that uh, we go into the executive session. We have no items that require a vote and therefore we'll adjourn directly from the executive session. Uh, I so move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you all very much for your attendance and uh, work today. Bye-bye.